Chapter One, Part One of *The Princess Aline*. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carolyn. *The Princess Aline* by Richard Harding Davis. Chapter One, Part One her royal highness the princess aline of hohenwald came into the life of morton carlton or morny carlton as men called him of new york city when that young gentleman's affairs and affections were best suited to receive her had she made her appearance three years sooner or three years later it is quite probable that she would have passed on out of his life with no more recognition from him than would have been expressed in a look of admiring curiosity but coming when she did when his time and heart were both unoccupied she had an influence upon young mr carlton which led him into doing several wise and many foolish things and which remained with him always carlton had reached a point in his life and very early in his life when he could afford to sit and ease and look back with modest satisfaction to what he had forced himself to do and forward with a pleasurable anticipation to whatsoever he might choose to do in the future the world had appreciated what he had done and had put much to his credit and he was prepared to draw upon this grandly at the age of twenty he had found himself his own master with excellent family connections but with no family his only relative being a bachelor uncle who looked at life from the point of view of the union club's windows and who objected to his nephew's leaving harvard to take up the study of art in paris in that city where at julian's he was nicknamed the junior carlton for the obvious reason that he was the older of the two carltons in the class and because he was well dressed he had shown himself a harder worker than others who were less careful of their appearance and of their manners his work of which he did not talk and his ambitions of which he also did not talk bore fruit early and at twenty-six he had become a portrait painter of international reputation then the french government purchased one of his paintings at an absurdly small figure and placed it in the luxembourg from whence it would in time depart to be buried in the hall of some provincial city and american millionaires and english lord mayors members of parliament and members of the institute masters of hounds in pink coats and ambassadors in gold lace and beautiful women of all nationalities and conditions sat before his easel and so when he returned to new york he was welcomed with an enthusiasm which showed that his countrymen had feared that the artistic atmosphere of the old world had stolen him from them forever he was particularly silent even at this date about his work and listened to what others had to say of it with much awe not unmixed with some amusement that it should be he who was capable of producing anything worthy of such praise we have been told what the mother duck felt when her ugly duckling turned into a swan but we have never considered how much the ugly duckling must have marvelled also carlton is probably the only living artist a brother artist had said of him who fails to appreciate how great his work is and on this being repeated to carlton by a good-natured friend he had replied cheerfully oh, well i'm sorry but it is certainly better to be the only one who doesn't appreciate it than to be the only one who does he had never understood why such a responsibility had been entrusted to him 
it was as he expressed it not at all in his line and young girls who sought to sit at the feet of the master found him making love to them in the most charming manner in the world as though he were not entitled to all the rapturous admiration of their very young hearts but had to sue for it like any ordinary mortal carlton always felt as though some day some one would surely come along and say look here young man this talent doesn't belong to you it's mine what do you mean by pretending that such an idle good-natured youth as yourself is entitled to such a gift of genius he felt that he was keeping it in trust as it were that it had been changed at birth and that the proper guardian would eventually relieve him of his treasure personally carlton was of the opinion that he should have been born in the active days of knight-errant to have had nothing more serious to do than to ride abroad with a blue ribbon fastened to the point of his lance and with the spirit to unhorse any one who objected to its colour or to the claims of superiority of the noble lady who had tied it there there was not in his opinion at the present day any sufficiently pronounced method of declaring admiration for the many lovely women this world contained a proposal of marriage he considered to be a mean and clumsy substitute for the older way and was uncomplimentary to the many other women left unasked and marriage itself required much more constancy than he could give he had a most romantic and old-fashioned ideal of women as a class and from the age of fourteen had been a devotee of hundreds of them as individuals and though in that time his ideal had received several severe shocks he still believed that the not impossible she existed somewhere and his conscientious efforts to find out whether every woman he met might not be that one had led him not unnaturally into many difficulties the trouble with me is he said that i care too much to make platonic friendship possible and don't care enough to marry any particular woman that is of course supposing that any particular one would be so little particular as to be willing to marry me how embarrassing it would be now he argued if when you were turning away from the chancel after the ceremony you should look at one of the bridesmaids and see the woman whom you really should have married how distressing that would be you couldn't very well stop and say i am very sorry my dear but it seems i have made a mistake that young woman on the right has a most interesting and beautiful face i am very much afraid that she is the one it would be too late then while now in my free state i can continue my search without any sense of responsibility why he would exclaim i have walked miles to get a glimpse of a beautiful woman in a suburban window and time and time again when i have seen a face in a passing brougham i have pursued it in a hansom and learned where the owner of the face lived and spent weeks in finding some one to present me only to discover that she was self-conscious or uninteresting or engaged still i had assured myself that she was not the one i am very conscientious and i consider it is my duty to go so far with every woman i meet as to be able to learn whether she is or is not the one and the sad result is that i am like a man who follows the hounds but is never in at the death well some married woman would say grimly i hope you will get your deserts some day and you will too some day some girl will make you suffer for this oh that's all right carlton would answer meekly lots of women have made me suffer if that's what you think i need some day the married woman would prophesy you will care for a woman so much that you will have no eyes for any one else that's the way it is when one is married
well when that's the way it is with me carlton would reply i certainly hope to get married but until it is i think it is safer for all concerned that i should not then carlton would go to the club and complain bitterly to one of his friends how unfair married women are he would say the idea of thinking a man could have no eyes but for one woman suppose i had never heard a note of music until i was twenty-five years of age and was then given my hearing do you suppose my pleasure in music would make me lose my pleasure in everything else suppose i met and married a girl at twenty-five is that going to make me forget all the women i knew before i met her i think not as a matter of fact i really deserve a great deal of credit for remaining single for i am naturally very affectionate but when i see what poor husbands my friends make i prefer to stay as i am until i am sure that i will make a better one it is only fair to the woman carlton was sitting at the club alone he had that sense of superiority over his fellows and of irresponsibility to the world about him that comes to a man when he knows that his trunks are being packed and that his state-room is engaged he was leaving new york long before most of his friends could get away he did not know just where he was going and preferred not to know he wished to have a complete holiday and to see europe as an idle tourist and not as an artist with an eye to his own improvement he had plenty of time and money he was sure to run across friends in the big cities and acquaintances he could make or not as he pleased en route he was not sorry to go his going would serve to put an end to what gossip there might be of his engagement to numerous young women whose admiration for him as an artist he was beginning to fear had taken a more personal tinge i wish he said gloomily i didn't like people so well it seems to cause them and me such a lot of trouble he sighed and stretched out his hand for a copy of one of the english illustrated papers it had a fresher interest to him because the next number of it that he would see would be in the city in which it was printed the paper in his hands was the st james's budget and it contained much fashionable intelligence concerning the preparations for a royal wedding which was soon to take place between members of two of the reigning families of europe there was on one page a half-tone reproduction of a photograph which showed a group of young people belonging to several of these reigning families with their names and titles printed above and below the picture they were princesses archdukes or grand dukes and they were dressed like young englishmen and women with no sign about them or their possible military or social rank one of these young princesses in the photograph was looking out of it and smiling in a tolerant amused way as though she had thought of something which she could not wait to enjoy until after the picture was taken she was not posing consciously as were some of the others but was sitting in a natural attitude with one arm over the back of her chair and with her hands clasped before her her face was full of a fine intelligence and humour and though one of the other princesses in the group was far more beautiful this particular one had a much more high-bred air and there was something of a challenge in her smile that made any one who looked at the picture smile also carlton studied the face for some time and mentally approved of its beauty the others seemed in comparison wooden and unindividual but this one looked like a person he might have known and whom he would certainly have liked he turned the page and surveyed the features of the oxford crew with less interest and then turned the page again and gazed critically and severely at the face of the princess with the high-bred smile 
he had hoped that he would find it less interesting at a second glance but it did not prove to be so the princess aline of hohenwald he read she's probably engaged to one of those johnnies beside her and the grand duke of hohenwald behind her must be her brother he put the paper down and went into luncheon and diverted himself by mixing a salad dressing but after a few moments he stopped in the midst of his employment and told the waiter with some unnecessary sharpness to bring him the last copy of the st james's budget confound it he added to himself he opened the paper with a touch of impatience and gazed long and earnestly at the face of the princess aline who continued to return his look with the same smile of amused tolerance carlton noted every detail of her tailor-made gown of her high mannish collar of her tie and even the rings on her hand there was nothing about her of which she could fairly disapprove he wondered why it was that she could not have been born an approachable new york girl instead of a princess of a little german duchy hitched in throughout her single life and to be traded off eventually in marriage with as much consideration as though she were a princess of a real kingdom she looks jolly too he mused in an injured tone and so very clever and of course she has a beautiful complexion all those german girls have your royal highness is more than pretty he said bowing his head gravely you look as a princess should look i am sure it was one of your ancestors who discovered that dried pea under a dozen mattresses he closed the paper and sat for a moment with a perplexed smile of consideration waiter he exclaimed suddenly send a messenger boy to britannos for a copy of the st james's budget and bring me the almanac de gotha from the library it is a little fat red book on the table near the window then carlton opened the paper again and propped it up against a carafe and continued his critical survey of the princess aline he seized the almanac when it came with some eagerness hohenwald maison de grasse he read and in small type below it première ligne cadette regnante grand ducal hohenwald et de grasse guillaume aubert frédéric charles louis grand duc de hohenwald et de grasse etc 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 that's her brother right enough muttered carlton and under the heading sirs he read quatre princesse aline victoria beatrice louise hélène grand duchesse née à grasse juin eighteen seventy two twenty-two years old exclaimed carlton what a perfect age i could not have invented a better one he looked from the book to the face before him now my dear young lady he said i know all about you you live at grasse and you are connected to judge by your names with all the english royalties and very pretty names they are too aline helene victoria beatrice you must be more english than you are german and i suppose you live in a little old castle and your brother has a standing army of twelve men and some day you are to marry a russian grand duke or whoever your brother's prime minister if he has a prime minister decides is best for the politics of your little toy kingdom ah to think exclaimed carlton softly that such a lovely and glorious creature as that should be sacrificed for so insignificant a thing as the peace of europe when she might make some young man happy he carried a copy of the paper to his room and cut the picture of the group out of the page and pasted it carefully on a stiff piece of cardboard 
then he placed it on his dressing-table in front of a photograph of a young woman in a large silver frame which was a sign had the young woman but known it that her reign for the time being was over nolan the young irishman who did for carlton knew better than to move it when he found it there he had learned to study his master since he had joined him in london and understood that one photograph in the silver frame was entitled to more consideration than three others on the writing-desk or half a dozen on the mantelpiece nolan had seen them come and go he had watched them rise and fall he had carried notes to them and books and flowers he had helped to dispose them from the silver frame and move them on by degrees down the line until they went ingloriously into the big brass bowl on the side table nolan approved highly of this last choice he did not know which one of the three in the group it might be but they were all pretty and their social standing was certainly distinguished guido the italian model who ruled over the studio and nolan were busily packing when carlton entered he always said that guido represented him in his professional and nolan in his social capacity guido cleaned the brushes and purchased the artist's materials nolan cleaned his riding boots and brought his theatre and railroad tickets guido said carlton there are two sketches i made in germany last year one of the prime minister and one of ludwig the actor get them out for me will you and pack them for shipping nolan he went on here is a telegram to send nolan would not have read a letter but he looked upon telegrams as public documents the reading of them as part of his perquisites this one was addressed to oscar von holz first secretary german embassy washington d c and the message read please telegraph me full title and address princess aline of hohenwald where would a letter reach her morton carlton the next morning nolan carried to the express office a box containing two oil paintings on small canvases they were addressed to the man in london who attended to the shipping and forwarding of carlton's pictures in that town End of part one of chapter one Chapter One, Part Two of *The Princess Aline* by Richard Harding Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter One, Part Two. There was a tremendous crowd on the New York. She sailed at the obliging hour of eleven in the morning, and many people, in consequence, whose affection would not have stood in the way of their breakfast, made it a point to appear and to say good-bye. Carlton, for his part, did not notice them. He knew by experience that the attractive-looking people always leave a steamer when the whistle blows and that the next most attractive looking who remain on board are ill all the way over a man that he knew seized him by the arm as he was entering his cabin and asked if he were crossing or just seeing people off well then i want to introduce you to miss morris and her aunt mrs downs they are going over and i should be glad if you would be nice to them but you know her i guess he asked over his shoulder as carlton pushed his way after him down the deck i know who she is he said miss edith morris was surrounded by a tribal circle of admiring friends and seemed to be holding her own they all stopped when carlton came up and looked at him rather closely and those whom he knew seemed to mark the fact by a particularly hearty greeting 
the man who had brought him up acted as though he had successfully accomplished a somewhat difficult and creditable feat carlton bowed himself away leaving miss morris to her friends and saying that she would probably have to see him later whether she wished it or not he then went to meet the aunt who received him kindly for there were very few people on the passenger list and she was glad they were to have his company before he left she introduced him to a young man named abby who was hovering around her most anxiously and whose interest she seemed to think it necessary to explain was due to the fact that he was engaged to miss morris mr abby left the steamer when the whistle blew and carlton looked after him gratefully he always enjoyed meeting attractive girls who were engaged as it left him no choice in the matter and excused him from finding out whether or not that particular young woman was the one mrs downs and her niece proved to be experienced sailors and faced the heavy sea that met the new york outside of sandy hook with unconcern carlton joined them and they stood together leaning with their backs to the rail and trying to fit the people who flitted past them to the names on the passenger list the young lady in the sailor suit said miss morris gazing at the top of the smokestack is miss kitty flood of grand rapids this is her first voyage and she thinks a steamer is something like a yacht and dresses for the part accordingly she does not know that it is merely a moving hotel i am afraid said carlton to judge from her agitation that hers is going to be what the professionals call a dressing-room part why is it he asked that the girls on a steamer who wear gold anchors and the men in yachting caps are always the first to disappear that man with the sombrero he went on is james m pollock united states consul to mauritius he is going out to his post i know he is the consul because he comes from fort worth texas and is therefore admirably fitted to speak either french or the native language of the island oh we don't send consuls to mauritius laughed miss morris mauritius is one of those places from which you buy stamps but no one really lives or goes there where are you going may i ask inquired carlton miss morris said that they were making their way to constantinople and athens and then to rome that as they had not had the time to take the southern route they purposed to journey across the continent direct from paris to the turkish capital by the orient express we shall be a few days in london and in paris only long enough for some clothes she replied the trousseau thought carlton weeks is what she should have said the three sat together at the captain's table and as the sea continued rough saw little of either the captain or his other guests and were thrown much upon the society of each other they had innumerable friends and interests in common and mrs downs who had been everywhere and for long seasons at a time proved as alive as her niece and carlton conceived a great liking for her she seemed to be just and kindly minded and owing to her age to combine the wider judgment of a man with the sympathetic interests of a woman sometimes they sat together in a row and read and gossiped over what they read or struggled up the deck as it rose and fell and buffeted with the wind and later they gathered in a corner of the saloon and ate late suppers of carlton's devising or drank tea in the captain's cabin which he had thrown open to them they had started knowing much about one another and this and the necessary proximity of the ship hastened their acquaintance End of chapter one part two
Chapter One, Part Three of *The Princess Aline* by Richard Harding Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter One, Part Three. The sea grew calmer the third day out, and the sun came forth and showed the decks as clean as breadboards miss morris and carlton seated themselves on the huge iron riding bits in the bow and with their elbows on the rail looked down at the whirling blue water and rejoiced silently in the steady rush of the great vessel and in the uncertain warmth of the march sun carlton was sitting to leeward of miss morris with a pipe between his teeth he was warm and at peace with the world he had found his new acquaintance more than entertaining she was even friendly and treated him as though he were much her junior as is the habit of young women lately married or who are about to be married carlton did not resent it on the contrary it made him more at his ease with her and as she herself chose to treat him as a youth he permitted himself to be as foolish as he pleased i don't know why it is he complained peering over the rail but whenever i look over the side to watch the waves a man in a greasy cap always sticks his head out of a hole below me and scatters a barrel full of ashes or potato peelings all over the ocean it spoils the effect for me next time he does it i am going to knock out the ashes of my pipe on the back of his neck miss morris did not consider this worthy of comment and there was a long lazy pause you haven't told us where you go after london she said and then without waiting for him to reply she asked is it your professional or your social side that you are treating to a trip this time who told you that asked carlton smiling oh i don't know some man he said you were a jekyll and hyde which is jekyll you see i only know your professional side you must try to find out for yourself by deduction he said as you picked out the other passengers i am going to grasse he continued it's the capital of hohenwald do you know it yes she said we were there once for a few days we went to see the pictures i suppose you know that the old duke the father of the present one ruined himself almost by buying pictures for the grasse gallery we were there at a bad time though when the palace was closed to visitors and the gallery too i suppose that is what is taking you there no carlton said shaking his head no it is not the pictures i am going to grasse he said gravely to see the young woman with whom i am in love miss morris looked up in some surprise and smiled consciously with a natural feminine interest in an affair of love and one which was a secret as well oh she said i beg your pardon we i had not heard of it no it is not a thing one could announce exactly said carlton it is rather in an embryo state as yet in fact i have not met the young lady so far but i mean to meet her that's why i am going abroad miss morris looked at him sharply to see if he were smiling but he was on the contrary gazing sentimentally at the horizon line and puffing meditatively on his pipe he was apparently in earnest and waiting for her to make some comment how very interesting was all she could think to say yes when you know the details it is very interesting he answered she is the princess aline of hohenwald he explained bowing his head as though he were making the two young ladies known to one another she has several other names six in all and her age is twenty-two 
that is all i know about her i saw her picture in an illustrated paper just before i sailed and i made up my mind i would meet her and here i am if she is not in grasse i intend to follow her to wherever she may be he waved his pipe at the ocean before him and recited with mock seriousness across the hills and far away beyond their utmost purple rim and deep into the dying day the happy princess followed him only in this case you see said carlton i am following the happy princess no but seriously though said miss morris what is it you mean are you going to paint her portrait i never thought of that exclaimed carlton i don't know but what your idea is a good one miss morris that's a great idea he shook his head approvingly i did not do wrong to confide in you he said it was perhaps taking a liberty but as you have not considered it as such i am glad i spoke but you don't really mean to tell me exclaimed the girl facing about and nodding her head at him that you are going abroad after a woman whom you have never seen and because you liked a picture of her in a paper i do said carlton because i like her picture and because she is a princess well upon my word said miss morris gazing at him with evident admiration that's what my younger brother would call a distinctly sporting proposition only i don't see she added what her being a princess has to do with it you don't laughed carlton easily that's the best part of it that's the plot the beauty of being in love with a princess miss morris he said lies in the fact that you can't marry her that you can love her deeply and forever and nobody will ever come to you and ask your intentions or hint that after such a display of affection you ought to do something now with a girl who is not a princess even if she understands the situation herself and wouldn't marry you to save her life still there is always some one a father or a mother or one of your friends who makes it his business to interfere and talks about it and bothers you both but with a princess you see that is all eliminated you can't marry a princess because they won't let you a princess has got to marry a real royal chap and so you are perfectly ineligible and free to sigh for her and make pretty speeches to her and see her as often as you can and revel in your devotion and unrequited affection miss morris regarded him doubtfully she did not wish to prove herself too credulous and you honestly want me mr carlton to believe that you are going abroad just for this you see carlton answered her if you only knew me better you would have no doubt on the subject at all it isn't the thing some men would do i admit but it is exactly what any one who knows me would expect of me i should describe it having had acquaintance with the young man for some time as being eminently characteristic and besides think what a good story it makes every other man who goes abroad this summer will try to tell about his travels when he gets back to new york and as usual no one will listen to him but they will have to listen to me you've been across since i saw you last what did you do they'll ask politely and then instead of simply telling them that i have been in paris or london i can say oh i've been chasing around the globe after the princess aline of hohenwald that sounds interesting doesn't it when you come to think of it carlton continued meditatively it is not so very remarkable men go all the way to cuba and mexico and even to india after orchids after a nasty flower that grows in an absurd way on the top of a tree why shouldn't a young man go as far as germany after a beautiful princess who walks on the ground and who can talk and think and feel she is much more worth while than an orchid 
miss morris laughed indulgently well i didn't know such devotion existed at this end of the century she said it's quite nice and encouraging i hope you will succeed i am sure i only wish we were going to be near enough to see how you get on i have never been a confidant when there was a real princess concerned she said it makes it so much more amusing may one ask what your plans are carlton doubted if he had any plans as yet i have to reach the ground first he said and after that i must reconnoitre i may possibly adopt your idea and ask to paint her portrait only i dislike confusing my social and professional sides as a matter of fact though he said after a pause laughing guiltily i have done a little of that already i prepared her as it were for my coming i sent her studies of two pictures i made last winter in berlin one of the prime minister and one of ludwig the tragedian at the court theatre i sent them to her through my london agent so that she would think they had come from some one of her english friends and i told the dealer not to let any one know who had forwarded them my idea was that it might help me perhaps if she knew something about me before i appeared in person it was a sort of letter of introduction written by myself well really expostulated miss morris you certainly woo in a royal way are you in the habit of giving away your pictures to any one whose photograph you happen to like that seems to me to be giving new lamps for old to a degree i must see if i haven't some of my sister's photographs in my trunk she is considered very beautiful well you wait until you see this particular portrait and you will understand it better said carlton the steamer reached southampton early in the afternoon and carlton secured a special compartment on the express to london for mrs downs and her niece and himself with one adjoining for their maid and nolan it was a beautiful day and carlton sat with his eyes fixed upon the passing fields and villages exclaiming with pleasure from time to time at the white roads and the feathery trees and hedges and the red roofs of the inns and square towers of the village churches hedges are better than barbed wire fences aren't they he said you see that girl picking wild flowers from one of them she looks as though she were posing for a picture for an illustrated paper she couldn't pick flowers from a barbed wire fence could she and there would probably be a tramp along the road somewhere to frighten her and see the chap in knickerbockers farther down the road leaning on the stile i am sure he is waiting for her and here comes a coach he ran on don't the red wheels look well against the hedges it's a pretty little country england isn't it like a private park or a model village i am glad to get back to it i am glad to see the three and six signs with the little slanting dash between the shillings and pennies yes even the steam rollers and the man with the red flag in front are welcome i suppose said miss downs it's because one has been so long on the ocean that the ride to london seems so interesting it always pays me for the entire trip yes she said with a sigh in spite of the patent medicine signs they have taken to putting up all along the road it seems a pity they should adopt our bad habits instead of our good ones they are a bit slow at adopting anything commented carlton did you know mrs downs that electric lights are still as scarce in london as they are in timbuktu why i saw an electric light plant put up in a western town in three days once there were over a hundred burners in one saloon and the engineer who put them up told me in confidence that what the chief engineer told him in confidence was never disclosed for at that moment miss morris interrupted him with a sudden sharp exclamation oh mr carlton she exclaimed breathlessly 
listen to this she had been reading one of the dozen papers which carlton had purchased at the station and was now shaking one of them at him with her eyes fixed on the open page my dear edith remonstrated her aunt mr carlton was telling us yes i know exclaimed miss morris laughing but this interests him much more than electric lights who do you think is in london she cried raising her eyes to his and pausing for proper dramatic effect the princess aline of hohenwald no shouted carlton yes miss morris answered mocking his tone listen the queen's drawing-room um on her right was the princess of wales um oh i can't find it no yes here it is next to her stood the princess aline of hohenwald she wore a dress of white silk with train of silver brocade trimmed with fur ornaments emeralds and diamonds orders victoria and albert jubilee commemoration medal coburg and gotha and hohenwald and grass by jove cried carlton excitedly i say is that really there let me see it please for myself miss morris handed him the paper with her finger on the paragraph and picking up another began a search down its columns you're right exclaimed carlton solemnly it's she sure enough and here i've been within two hours of her and didn't know it miss morris gave another triumphant cry as though she had discovered a vein of gold yes and here she is again she said in the gentlewoman the queen's dress was of black as usual but relieved by a few violet ribbons in the bonnet and princess beatrice who sat by her mother's side showed but little trace of the anxiety caused by princess ena's accident princess aline on the front seat in a light brown jacket and a becoming bonnet gave the necessary touch to a picture which londoners would be glad to look upon more often carlton sat staring forward with his hands on his knees and with his eyes open wide from excitement he presented so unusual an appearance of bewilderment and delight that mrs downs looked at him and her niece for some explanation the young lady seems to interest you said she tentatively she is the most charming creature in the world mrs downs cried carlton and i was going all the way to grasse to see her and now it turns out that she is here in england within a few miles of us he turned and waved his hands at the passing landscape every minute brings us nearer together and you didn't feel it in the air mocked miss morris laughing you are a pretty poor sort of a man to let a girl tell you where to find the woman you love carlton did not answer but stared at her very seriously and frowned intently now i have got to begin all over again and readjust things he said we might have guessed she would be in london on account of this royal wedding it is a great pity it isn't later in the season when there would be more things going on and more chances of meeting her now they will all be interested in themselves and being extremely exclusive no one who isn't a cousin to the bridegroom or an emperor would have any chance at all still i can see her i can look at her and that's something it is better than a photograph anyway said miss morris they will be either at buckingham palace or at windsor so they will stop at brown's said carlton all royalties go to brown's i don't know why unless it is because it's so expensive or maybe it is expensive because royalties go there but in any event if they are not at the palace that is where they will be and that is where i shall have to go too when the train drew up at victoria station carlton directed nolan to take his things to brown's hotel but not to unload them until he had arrived then he drove with the ladies to cox's and saw them settled there 
he promised to return at once to dine and to tell them what he had discovered in his absence you've got to help me in this miss morris he said nervously i am beginning to feel that i am not worthy of her oh yes you are she said laughing but don't forget that it's not the lover who comes to woo but the lover's way of wooing and that faint heart and the rest of it yes i know said carlton doubtfully but it's a bit sudden isn't it oh i am ashamed of you you are frightened no not frightened exactly said the painter i think it's just natural emotion as carlton turned into albemarle street he noticed a red carpet stretching from the doorway of brown's hotel out across the sidewalk to a carriage and a bare-headed man bustling about apparently assisted several gentlemen to get into it this and another carriage and nolan's four-wheeler blocked the way but without waiting for them to move up carlton leaned out of his hansom and called the bare-headed man to his side is the duke of hohenwald stopping at your hotel he asked the bare-headed man answered that he was all right nolan cried carlton they can take in the trunks hearing this the bare-headed man hastened to help carlton to alight that was the duke who just drove off sir and those he said pointing to three muffled figures who were stepping into a second carriage are his sisters the princesses carlton stopped midway with one foot on the step and the other in the air the deuce they are he exclaimed and which is he began eagerly and then remembering himself dropped back on the cushions of the hansom he broke into the little dining-room at cox's in so excited a state that two dignified old gentlemen who were eating there sat open-mouthed in astonished disapproval mrs downs and miss morris had just come downstairs i have seen her carlton cried ecstatically only half an hour in the town and i've seen her already no really exclaimed miss morris and how did she look is she as beautiful as you expected oh, well i can't tell yet carlton answered there were three of them and they were all muffled up and which one of the three she was i don't know she wasn't labelled as in the picture but she was there and i saw her the woman i love was one of that three and i have engaged rooms at the hotel and this very night the same roof shelters us both End of chapter one part three chapter two part one of the princess aline by richard harding davis this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter two part one the course of true love certainly runs smoothly with you said miss morris as they seated themselves at the table what is your next move what do you mean to do now the rest is very simple said carlton to-morrow morning i will go to the row i will be sure to find some one there who knows all about them where they are going and who they are seeing and what engagements they may have then it will be only a matter of looking up some friend in the household or in one of the embassies who can present me oh said miss morris in the tone of keenest disappointment but that is such a commonplace ending you started out so romantically couldn't you manage to meet her in a less conventional way i am afraid not said carlton you see i want to meet her very much and to meet her very soon and the quickest way of meeting her whether it's romantic or not isn't a bit too quick for me there will be romance enough after i am presented if i have my way but carlton was not to have his way 
for he had overlooked the fact that it requires as many to make an introduction as a bargain and he had left the duke of hohenwald out of his considerations he met many people he knew in the row the next morning they asked him to lunch and brought their horses up to the rail and he patted the horses heads and led the conversation around to the royal wedding and through it to the hohenwalds he learned that they had attended a reception at the german embassy on the previous night and it was one of the secretaries of that embassy who informed him of their intended departure that morning on the eleven o'clock train to paris to paris cried carlton in consternation what all of them yes all of them of course why asked the young german but carlton was already dodging across the tan bark to piccadilly and waving his stick at a hansom nolan met him at the door of brown's hotel with an anxious countenance their royal highnesses have gone sir he said but i've packed your trunks and sent them to the station shall i follow them sir yes said carlton follow the trunks and follow the hohenwalds i will come over to the club train at four meet me at the station and tell me to what hotel they have gone oh, wait if i miss you you can find me at the hotel continental but if they go straight on through paris you go with them and telegraph me here and to the continental telegraph at every station so i can keep track of you have you enough money i have sir enough for a long trip sir well you'll need it said carlton grimly this is going to be a long trip it is twenty minutes to eleven now you will have to hurry have you paid my bill here i have sir said nolan then get off and don't lose sight of those people again carlton attended to several matters of business and then lunched with mrs downs and her niece he had grown to like them very much and was sorry to lose sight of them but consoled himself by thinking he would see them a few days at least in paris he judged that he would be there for some time as he did not think the princess aline and her sisters would pass through that city without stopping to visit the shops on the rue de la paix all women are not princesses he argued but all princesses are women we will be in paris on wednesday mrs downs told him the orient express leaves there twice a week on mondays and thursdays and we have taken an apartment for next thursday and will go right on to constantinople but i thought you said you had to buy a lot of clothes there carlton expostulated mrs downs said that they would do that on their way home nolan met carlton at the station and told him that he had followed the hohenwalds to the hotel meurice there's the duke sir and the three princesses nolan said and there are two german gentlemen acting as equerries and an english captain a sort of a d c to the duke and two elderly ladies and eight servants they travel very simply sir and their people are in undress livery brown and red sir carlton pretended not to listen to this he had begun to doubt but that nolan's zeal would lead him into some indiscretion and would end disastrously to himself he spent the evening alone in front of the cafe de la paix pleasantly occupied in watching the life and movement of that great meeting on the highways it did not seem possible that he had ever been away it was as though he had picked up a book and opened it at the page and place at which he had left off reading it a moment before there was the same type the same plot and the same characters who were doing the same characteristic things even the waiter who tipped out his coffee knew him and he knew or felt as though he knew half of those who passed or who shared with him the half of the sidewalk the women at the next table considered the slim good-looking young american with friendly curiosity and the men with them discussed him in french 
until a well-known parisian recognized carlton in passing and hailed him joyously in the same language at which the women laughed and the men looked sheepishly conscious on the following morning carlton took up his post in the open court of the maurice with his coffee and the figaro to excuse his loitering there he had not been occupied with these over long before nolan approached him in some excitement with the information that their royal highnesses as he delighted to call them were at the moment coming down the lift carlton could hear their voices and wished to step around the corner and see them it was for this chance he had been waiting but he could not afford to act in so undignified a manner before nolan so he merely crossed his legs nervously and told the servant to go back to the rooms confound him he said i wish he would let me conduct my own affairs in my own way if i don't stop him he'll carry the princess aline off by force and send me word where he has hidden her the hohenwalds had evidently departed for a day's outing as up to five o'clock they had not returned and carlton after loitering all the afternoon gave up waiting for them and went out to dine at laurent's in the champs-elysees he had finished his dinner and was leaning luxuriously forward with his elbows on the table and knocking the cigar ashes into his coffee-cup he was pleasantly content the trees hung heavy with leaves over his head a fountain plate and overflowed at his elbow and the lamps of the fiacre passing and repassing on the avenue of the champs-elysees shone like giant fireflies through the foliage the touch of the gravel beneath his feet emphasized the free out-of-door charm of the place and the faces of the others around him looked more than usually cheerful in the light of the candles flickering under the clouded shades his mind had gone back to his earlier student days in paris when life always looked as it did now in the brief half-hour of satisfaction which followed a cold bath or a good dinner and he had forgotten himself and his surroundings it was the voices of the people at the table behind him that brought him back to the present moment a man was talking he spoke in english with an accent i should like to go again through the luxembourg he said but you need not be bound by what i do i think it would be pleasanter if we all keep together said a girl's voice quietly she also spoke in english and with the same accent the people whose voices had interrupted him were sitting and standing around a long table which the waiters had made large enough for their party by placing three of the smaller ones side by side they had finished their dinner and the women who sat with their backs towards carlton were pulling on their gloves which is it to be then said the gentleman smiling the pictures or the dressmakers the girl who had first spoken turned to the one next to her which would you rather do aline she asked carlton moved so suddenly that the men behind him looked at him curiously but he turned nevertheless in his chair and faced them and in order to excuse his doing so beckoned to one of the waiters he was within two feet of the girl who had been called aline she raised her head to speak and saw carlton staring open-eyed at her she glanced at him for an instant as if to assure herself that she did not know him and then turning to her brother smiled in the same tolerant amused way in which she had so often smiled upon carlton from the picture i am afraid i had rather go to the Beaumarche, she said one of the waiters stepped in between them and carlton asked him for his bill but when it came he left it lying on the plate and sat staring out into the night between the candles puffing sharply on his cigar and recalling to his memory the first sight of the princess aline of hohenwald that night 
as he returned into bed he gave a comfortable sigh of content i am glad she chose the dressmakers instead of the pictures he said mrs downs and miss morris arrived in paris on wednesday and expressed their anxiety to have carlton lunch with them and to hear him tell of the progress of his love affair there was not much to tell the hohenwalds had come and gone from the hotel as freely as any other tourists in paris but the very lack of ceremony about their movements was in itself a difficulty the manner of acquaintance he could make in the court of the hotel meurice with one of the men over a cup of coffee or a glass of bock would be as readily discontinued as begun and for his purpose it would have been much better if the hohenwalds had been living in state with a visitor's book and a chamberlain on wednesday evening carlton took the ladies to the opera where the hohenwalds occupied a box immediately opposite them carlton pretended to be surprised at this fact but mrs downs doubted his sincerity i saw nolan talk to their courier to-day she said and i fancy he asked a few leading questions well he didn't learn much if he did he said the fellow only talks german ah then he has been asking questions said miss morris oh well he does it on his own responsibility said carlton for i told him to have nothing to do with servants he has too much zeal has nolan i'm afraid of him if you were only half as interested as he is said miss morris you would have known her long ago long ago exclaimed carlton i only saw her four days since she is certainly very beautiful said miss morris looking across the auditorium but she isn't there said carlton that's the eldest sister the two other sisters went out on the coach this morning to versailles and were too tired to come to-night at least so nolan says he seems to have established a friendship for the english maid but whether it's on my account or his own i don't know i doubt his unselfishness how disappointing of her said miss morris and after you had selected a box just across the way too it is such a pity to waste it on us carlton smiled and looked up at her impudently as though he meant to say something but remembering that she was engaged to be married changed his mind and lowered his eyes to his programme why didn't you say it asked miss morris calmly turning her glass to the stage wasn't it pretty no said carlton not pretty enough the ladies left the hotel the next day to take the orient express which left paris at six o'clock they had bidden carlton good-bye at four the same afternoon and as he had come to their rooms for that purpose they were in consequence a little surprised to see him at the station running wildly across the platform followed by nolan and a porter he came into their compartment after the train had started and shook his head sadly at them from the door well what do you think of this he said you can't get rid of me you see i'm going with you going with us asked mrs downs how far carlton laughed and coming inside dropped on to the cushions with a sigh i don't know he said dejectedly all the way i'm afraid that is i mean i'm very glad that i am to have your society for a few days more but really i didn't bargain for this you don't mean to tell me that they are on this train said miss morris they are said carlton they have a car to themselves at the rear they only made up their minds to go this morning and they nearly succeeded in giving me the slip again but it seems that their english maid stopped nolan in the hall to bid him good-bye and so he found out their plans they are going direct to constantinople and then to athens 
they had meant to stay in paris two weeks longer it seems but they changed their minds last night it was a very close shave for me i only got back to the hotel in time to hear from the concierge that nolan had flown with all my things and left word for me to follow just fancy suppose i had missed the train and had had to chase him clear across the continent of europe with not even a razor i am glad said miss morris that nolan has not taken a fancy of me i doubt if i could resist such impetuosity End of chapter two part one Chapter two part two of the Princess Aline by Richard Harding Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter two part two. The Orient Express, in which Carlton and the mistress of his heart and fancy were speeding towards the horizon's utmost purple rim, was made up of six cars one dining-car with a smoking apartment attached and five sleeping-cars including the one reserved for the duke of hohenwald and his suite these cars were lightly built and rocked in consequence and the dust raised by the rapid movements of the train swept through cracks and open windows and sprinkled the passengers with a fine and irritating coating of soot and earth there was one servant to the entire twenty-two passengers he spoke eight languages and never slept but as his services were in demand by several people in as many different cars at the same moment he satisfied no one and the complaint box in the smoking-car was stuffed full to the slot in consequence before they had crossed the borders of france carlton and miss morris went out upon one of the platforms and sat down upon a tool-box it isn't as comfortable here as in an observation car at home said carlton but it's just as noisy he pointed out to her from time to time the peasants gathering twigs and the blue-bloused gendarmes guarding the woods and the fences skirting them nothing is allowed to go to waste in this country he said it looks as though they went over it once a month with a lawn-mower and a pruning-knife i believe they number the trees as we number the houses and did you notice the great fortifications covered with grass she said we have passed such a lot of them carlton nodded and did you notice that they all faced only one way carlton laughed and nodded again towards germany he said by the next day they had left the tall poplars and white roads behind them and were crossing the land of low shiny black helmets and brass spikes they had come into a country of low mountains and black forests with old fortified castles topping the hills and with red-roofed villages scattered around the base how very military it all is mrs downs said even the men at the lonely little stations in the forests wear uniforms and do you notice how each of them rolls up his red flag and holds it like a sword and salutes the train as it passes they spent the hour during which the train was shifted from one station in vienna to the other driving about in an open carriage and stopped for a few moments in front of a cafe to drink beer and to feel solid earth under them again returning to their train with a feeling which was almost that of getting back to their own rooms they came to great steps covered with long thick grass and flooded in places with little lakes of broken ice great horned cattle stood knee-deep in its grass 
and at the villages and way-stations were people wearing sheepskin jackets and waistcoats covered with silver buttons in one place there was a wedding procession waiting for the train to pass with the friends of the bride and groom in their best clothes the women with silver breastplates and boots to their knees it seemed hardly possible that only two days before they had seen another wedding-party in the champs-elysees where the men wore evening dress and the women were bareheaded and with long trains in forty-eight hours they had passed through republics principalities empires and kingdoms and from spring to winter it was like walking rapidly over a painted panorama of europe on the second evening carlton went off into the smoking-car alone the duke of hohenwald and two of his friends had finished a late supper and were seated in the apartment adjoining it the duke was a young man with a heavy beard and eyeglasses he was looking over an illustrated catalogue of the salon and as carlton dropped on the sofa opposite the duke raised his head and looked at him curiously and then turned over several pages of the catalogue and studied one of them and then back at carlton as though he were comparing him with something on the page before him carlton was looking out at the night but he could follow what was going forward as it was reflected in the glass of the car window he saw the duke hand the catalogue to one of the equerries who raised his eyebrows and nodded his head in assent carlton wondered what this might mean until he remembered that there was a portrait of himself by a french artist in the salon and concluded it had been reproduced in the catalogue he could think of nothing else which would explain the interest the two men showed in him on the morning following he sent nolan out to purchase a catalogue at the first station at which they stopped and found that his guess was a correct one a portrait of himself had been reproduced in black and white with his name below it well they know who i am now he said to miss morris even if they don't know me that honour is still in store for them i wish they did not lock themselves up so tightly said miss morris i want to see her very much cannot we walk up and down the platform at the next station she may be at the window of course said carlton you could have seen her at budapest if you had spoken of it she was walking up and down then the next time the train stops we will prowl up and down and feast our eyes upon her but miss morris had her wish gratified without that exertion the hohenwalds were served in the dining-car after the other passengers had finished and were in consequence only to be seen when they passed by the doors of the other compartments but this same morning after luncheon the three princesses instead of returning to their own car seated themselves in the compartment adjoining the dining-car while the men of their party lit their cigars and sat in a circle around them i was wondering how long they could stand three men smoking in one of the boxes they call cars said mrs downs she was seated between miss morris and carlton directly opposite the hohenwalds and so near them that she had to speak in a whisper to avoid doing this miss morris asked carlton for a pencil and scribbled with it in the novel she held on her lap then she passed them both back to him and said aloud have you read this it has such a pretty dedication their dedication read which is aline and carlton taking the pencil in his turn made a rapid sketch of her on the fly-leaf and wrote beneath it this is she do you wonder why i travelled four thousand miles to see her miss morris took the book again and glanced at the sketch and then at the three princesses and nodded her head 
it is very beautiful she said gravely looking out at the passing landscape oh, well not beautiful exactly answered carlton surveying the hills critically but certainly very attractive it is worth travelling a long way to see and i should think one would grow very fond of it miss morris tore the fly-leaf out of the book and slipped it between the pages may i keep it she asked carlton nodded and will you sign it she asked smiling carlton shrugged his shoulders and laughed if you wish it he answered the princess wore a grey cheviot travelling dress as did her sisters and a grey alpine hat she was leaning back talking to the english captain who accompanied them and laughing carlton thought he had never seen a woman who appealed so strongly to every taste of which he was possessed she seemed so sure of herself so alert and yet so gracious so easily entertained and yet when she turned her eyes towards the strange dismal landscape so seriously intent upon its sad beauty the english captain dropped his head and with the pretence of pulling at his moustache covered his mouth as he spoke to her when he had finished he gazed consciously at the roof of the car and she kept her eyes fixed steadily at the object towards which they had turned when he had ceased speaking and then after a decent pause turned her eyes as carlton knew she would towards him he was telling her who i am he thought and about the picture and the catalogue in a few moments she turned to her sister and spoke to her pointing out at something in the scenery and the same pantomime was repeated and again with the third sister did you see those girls talking about you mr carlton miss morris asked after they had left the car carlton said it looked as though they were of course they were said miss morris that englishman told the princess aline something about you and then she told her sister and she told the eldest one it would be nice if they inherit their father's interest in painting wouldn't it i would rather have it degenerate into an interest in painters myself said carlton miss morris discovered after she had returned to her own car that she had left the novel where she had been sitting and carlton sent nolan back for it it had slipped to the floor and the fly-leaf upon which carlton had sketched the princess aline was lying face down beside it nolan picked up the leaf and saw the picture and read the inscription below this is she do you wonder i travelled four thousand miles to see her he handed the book to miss morris and was backing out of the compartment when she stopped him there was a loose page in this nolan she said it's gone did you see it a loose page miss said nolan with some concern oh yes miss i was going to tell you there was a scrap of paper blew away when i was passing between the carriages was it something you wanted miss something i wanted exclaimed miss morris in dismay carlton laughed easily it is just as well i didn't sign it after all he said i don't want to proclaim my devotion to any hungarian gypsy who happens to read english you must draw me another as a souvenir miss morris said nolan continued on through the length of the car until he had reached the one occupied by the hohenwalds where he waited on the platform until the english maid-servant saw him and came to the door of the carriage what hotel are your people going to stop at in constantinople nolan asked the grande bretagne i think she answered 
that's right said nolan approvingly that's the one we are going to i thought i would come and tell you about it and by the way he said here's a picture somebody's made of your princess aline she dropped it and i picked it up you had better give it back to her oh well he added politely i am glad you are coming to our hotel in constantinople it's pleasant having some one to talk to who can speak your own tongue the girl returned to the car and left nolan alone upon the platform he exhaled a long breath of suppressed excitement and then gazed around nervously upon the empty landscape i fancy that's going to hurry things up a bit he murmured with an anxious smile he'd never get along at all if it wasn't for me End of chapter two part two chapter two part three of the princess aline by richard harding davis this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter two part three for reasons possibly best understood by the german ambassador the state of the hohenwalds at constantinople differed greatly from that which had obtained at the french capital they no longer came and went as they wished or wandered through the show-places of the city like ordinary tourists there was on the contrary not only a change in their manner towards others but there was an insistence on their part of a difference in the attitude of others towards themselves this showed itself in the reserving of the half of the hotel for their use and in the haughty bearing of the equerries who appeared unexpectedly in magnificent uniforms the visitor's book was covered with the autographs of all of the important people in the turkish capital and the sultan's carriages stood constantly before the door of the hotel awaiting their pleasure until they became as familiar a sight as the street dogs or as cabs in a handsome cab rank and in following out the programme which had been laid out for her the princess aline became even less accessible to carlton than before and he grew desperate and despondent if the worst comes he said to miss morris i shall tell nolan to give an alarm of fire some night and then i will run in and rescue her before they find out there is no fire or he might frighten the horses some day and give me a chance to stop them we might even wait until we reach greece and have her carried off by brigands who would only give her up to me there are no more brigands in greece said miss morris and besides why do you suppose they would only give her up to you because they would be imitation brigands said carlton and would be paid to give her up to no one else oh you plan very well scoffed miss morris but you don't do anything carlton was saved the necessity of doing anything that same morning when the english captain in attendance on the duke sent his card to carlton's room he came he explained to present the prince's compliments and would it be convenient for mr carlton to meet the duke that afternoon mr carlton suppressed an unseemly desire to shout and said after a moment's consideration that it would he then took the english captain down the stairs to the smoking-room and rewarded him for his agreeable message the duke received carlton in the afternoon and greeted him most cordially and with as much ease of manner as it was possible for a man to possess who has never enjoyed the benefits of meeting other men on an equal footing he expressed his pleasure in knowing an artist with whose work he was so familiar and congratulated himself on the happy accident which had brought them both to the same hotel i may have more than a natural interest in meeting you said the prince 
and for a reason which you may or may not know i thought possibly you could help me somewhat i have within the past few days come into the possession of two of your paintings they are studies rather but to me they are even more desirable than the finished work and i am not correct in saying that they have come to me exactly but to my sister the princess aline carlton could not withhold a certain start of surprise he had not expected that his gift would so soon have arrived but his face showed only polite attention the studies were delivered to us in london continued the duke they are of ludwig the tragedian and of the german prime minister two most valuable works and especially interesting to us they came without any note or message which would inform us who had sent them and when my people made inquiries the dealer refused to tell them from whom they had come he had been ordered to forward them to grasse but on learning of our presence in london sent them direct to our hotel there of course it is embarrassing to have so valuable a present from an anonymous friend especially so for my sister to whom they were addressed and i thought that besides the pleasure of meeting one of whose genius i am so warm an admirer i might also learn something which would enable me to discover who our friend may be he paused but as carlton said nothing continued as it is now i do not feel that i can accept the pictures and yet i know no one to whom they can be returned unless i send them to the dealer it sounds very mysterious said carlton smiling and i am afraid i cannot help you what work i did in germany was sold in berlin before i left and in a year may have changed hands several times the studies of which you speak are unimportant and merely studies and could pass from hand to hand without much record having been kept of them but personally i am not able to give you any information which would assist you in tracing them yes said the duke well then i shall keep them until i can learn more and if we can learn nothing i shall return them to the dealer carlton met miss morris that afternoon in a state of great excitement it's come he cried it's come i am to meet her this week i have met her brother and he has asked me to dine with them on thursday night that's the day before they leave for athens and he particularly mentioned that his sister would be at the dinner and that it would be a pleasure to present me it seems that the eldest paints and all of them love art for art's sake as their father taught them to do and for all we know he may make me court painter and i shall spend the rest of my life at grasse painting portraits of the princess aline at the age of twenty-two and at all future ages and if he does give me a commission to paint her i can tell you now in confidence that that picture will require more sittings than any other picture ever painted by man her hair will have turned white by the time it is finished and the gown she had started to pose in will have become forty years behind the fashion End of chapter two part three chapter two part four of the princess aline by richard harding davis this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter two part four on the morning following carlton and mrs downs and her niece with all the tourists in constantinople were placed in open carriages by their dragomans and driven in a long procession to the seraglio to see the sultan's treasures those of them who had waited two weeks for this chance looked aggrieved at the more fortunate who had come at the eleventh hour of the last night's steamer and seemed to think these latter had attained the privilege without sufficient effort the ministers of the different legations as is the harmless custom of such gentlemen 
had impressed every one for whom they had obtained permission to see the treasures with the great importance of the service rendered and had succeeded in making every one feel either especially honoured or especially uncomfortable at having given them so much trouble this sense of obligation and the fact that the dragomans had assured the tourists that they were for the time being the guests of the sultan awed and depressed most of the visitors to such an extent that their manner in the long procession of carriages suggested a funeral cortege with the hohenwalds in front escorted by beys and pashas as chief mourners the procession halted at the palace and the guests of the sultan were received by numerous effendis in single button frock coats and freshly ironed fezzes who served them with glasses of water and a huge bowl of some sweet stuff of which every one was supposed to take a spoonful there was at first a general fear among the cook's tourists that there would not be enough of this to go around which was succeeded by a greater anxiety lest they should be served twice some of the tourists put the sweet stuff in their mouths direct and licked the spoon and others dropped it off the spoon into the glass of water and stirred it about and sipped at it and no one knew who had done the right thing not even those who happened to have done it carlton and miss morris went out on the terrace while this ceremony was going forward and looked out over the great panorama of waters with the sea of marmora on one side the golden horn on the other and the bosporus at their feet the sun was shining mildly and the waters were stirred by great and little vessels before them on the opposite bank rose the dark green cypresses which marked the grim cemetery of england's dead and behind them were the great turtle-backed mosques and pencil-like minarets of the two cities and close at hand the mosaic walls and beautiful gardens of constantinople your friends the hohenwalds don't seem to know you this morning she said oh yes he spoke to me as we left the hotel carlton answered but they are on parade at present there are a lot of their countrymen among the tourists i feel rather sorry for them miss morris said looking at the group with an amused smile etiquette cuts them off from so much innocent amusement now you are a gentleman and the duke presumably is and why should you not go over and say your highness i wish you would present me to your sister whom i am to meet at dinner to-morrow night i admire her very much and then you could point out the historical features to her and show her where they have finished off a blue and green tiled wall with a rusty tin roof and make pretty speeches to her it wouldn't hurt her and it would do you a lot of good the simplest way is always the best way it seems to me oh yes of course said carlton suppose he came over here and said carlton i wish you would present me to your young american friend i admire her very much i would probably say do you oh well you will have to wait until she expresses some desire to meet you no etiquette is all right in itself only some people don't know its laws and that is the one instance to my mind where ignorance of the law is no excuse carlton left miss morris talking with the secretary of the american legation and went to look for mrs downs when he returned he found that the young secretary had apparently asked and obtained permission to present the duke's equerries and some of his diplomatic confreres who were standing now about her in an attentive semicircle and pointing out the different palaces and points of interest 
carlton was somewhat disturbed at the sight and reproached himself with not having presented any one to her before he was sure now that she must have had a dull time of it but he wished nevertheless that if she was to meet other men the secretary had allowed him to act as master of ceremonies i suppose you know that gentleman was saying as carlton came up that when you pass by abydos on the way to athens you will see where leander swam the hellespont to meet hero that little white lighthouse is called leander in honour of him it makes rather an interesting contrast does it not to think of that chap swimming along in the dark and then to find that his monument to-day is a lighthouse with revolving lamps and electric appliances and with ocean tramps and bridges and men-of-war around it we have improved in our mechanism since then he said with an air but i am afraid the men of to-day don't do that sort of thing for the women of to-day then it is the men who have deteriorated said one of the equerries bowing to miss morris it is certainly not the women the two americans looked at miss morris to see how she received this but she smiled good-naturedly i know a man who did more than that for a woman said carlton innocently he crossed an ocean and several countries to meet her and he hasn't met her yet miss morris looked at him and laughed in the safety that no one understood him but herself but he ran no danger she answered he didn't did he said carlton looking at her closely and laughing i think he was in very great danger all the time shocking said miss morris reprovingly and in her very presence too she knitted her brows and frowned at him i really believe if you were in prison you would make pretty speeches to the jailer's daughter yes said carlton boldly or even to a woman who was a prisoner herself i don't know what you mean she said turning away from him to the others how far was it that leander swam she asked the english captain pointed out two spots on either bank and said that the shores of abydos were a little over that distance apart as far as that said miss morris how much you must have cared for her she turned to carlton for an answer i beg your pardon he said he was measuring the distance between the two points with his eyes i said how much he must have cared for her you wouldn't swim that far for a girl for a girl laughed carlton quickly i was just thinking i would do it for fifty dollars the english captain gave a hasty glance at the distance he had pointed out and then turned to carlton i'll take you he said seriously i bet you twenty pounds you can't do it there was an easy laugh at carlton's expense but he only shook his head and smiled leave him alone captain said the american secretary it seems to me i remember a story of mr carlton's swimming out from nave sink to meet an ocean liner it was about three miles and the ocean was rather rough and when they slowed up he asked them if it was raining in london when they left they thought he was mad is that true carlton asked the englishman something like it said the american except that i didn't ask them if it was raining in london i asked them for a drink and it was they who were mad they thought i was drowning and slowed up to lower a boat and when they found out i was just swimming around they were naturally angry well i'm glad you didn't bet with me said the captain with a relieved laugh that evening as the englishman was leaving the smoking-room and after he had bidden carlton good-night he turned back and said 
i didn't like to ask you before those men this morning but there was something about your swimming adventure i wanted to know did you get that drink i did said carlton in a bottle they nearly broke my shoulder as carlton came into the breakfast-room on the morning of the day he was to meet the princess aline at dinner miss morris was there alone and he sat down at the same table opposite to her she looked at him critically and smiled with evident amusement to-day she quoted solemnly the birthday of my life has come carlton poured out his coffee with a shake of his head and frowned oh you can laugh he said but i didn't sleep at all last night i lay awake making speeches to her i know they are going to put me between the wrong sisters he complained or next to one of those old ladies in waiting or whatever they are how are you going to begin said miss morris will you tell her you have followed her from london or from new york rather that you are a young lochnivar who came out of the west and i don't know said carlton meditatively just how i shall begin but i know the curtain is going to rise promptly at eight o'clock about the time the soup comes on i think i don't see how she can help but be impressed a little bit it isn't every day a man hurries around the globe on account of a girl's photograph and she is beautiful isn't she miss morris nodded her head encouragingly do you know sometimes said carlton glancing over his shoulders to see if the waiters were out of hearing i fancy she has noticed me once or twice i have turned my head in her direction without meaning to and found her looking well looking my way at least don't you think that is a good sign he asked eagerly it depends on what you call a good sign said miss morris judicially it is a sign you're good to look at if that's what you want but you probably know that already and it's not to your credit it certainly isn't a sign that a person cares for you because she prefers to look at your profile rather than at what the dragomans are trying to show her carlton drew himself up stiffly if you knew your alice better he said with severity you would understand that it is not polite to make personal remarks i ask you as my confidant if you think she has noticed me and you make fun of my looks that's not the part of a confidant noticed you laughed miss morris scornfully how could she help it you are always in the way you are at the door whenever they go out or come in and when we are visiting mosques and palaces you are invariably looking at her instead of the tombs and things with a wistful far-away look as though you saw a vision the first time you did it after you had turned away i saw her feel to see if her hair was all right you quite embarrassed her i didn't i don't stammered carlton indignantly i wouldn't be so rude oh i see i'll have to get another confidant you are most unsympathetic and unkind but miss morris showed her sympathy later in the day when carlton needed it sorely for the dinner towards which he had looked with such pleasurable anticipations and lover-like misgivings did not take place the sultan sylvia corey informed him had with oriental unexpectedness invited the duke to dine that night at the palace and the duke much to his expressed regret had been forced to accept what was in the nature of a command he sent word by his equerry however that the dinner to mr carlton was only a pleasure deferred and that at athens where he understood carlton was also going he hoped to have the pleasure of entertaining him and making him known to his sisters he is a selfish young egoist said carlton to mrs downs 
as if i cared whether he was at the dinner or not why wouldn't he have fixed it so i might have dined with his sisters alone we would never have missed him i'll never meet her now i know it i feel it fate is against me now i will have to follow them on to athens and something will turn up there to keep me away from her you'll see you'll see i wonder where they go from athens the hohenwalds departed the next morning and as their party had engaged all the stage rooms in the little italian steamer carlton was forced to wait over for the next he was very gloomy over this disappointment and miss morris did her best to amuse him she and her aunt were never idle now and spent the last few days of their stay in constantinople in the bazaars or in excursions up and down the river these are my last days of freedom miss morris said to him once and i mean to make the most of them after this there will be no more travelling for me and i love it so she added wistfully carlton made no comment but he felt a certain contemptuous pity for the young man in america who had required such a sacrifice she is too nice a girl to let him know she is making a sacrifice he thought or giving up anything for him but she won't forget it and carlton again commended himself for not having asked any woman to make any sacrifices for him End of chapter two part four chapter two part five of the princess aline by richard harding davis this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter two part five they left constantinople for athens one moonlit night three days after the hohenwalds had taken their departure and as the evening and the air were warm they remained upon the upper deck until the boat had entered the dardanelles there were few passengers and mrs downs went below early leaving miss morris and carlton hanging over the rail and looking down upon a band of hungarian gipsies who were playing the weird music of their country on the deck beneath them the low receding hills lay close on either hand and ran back so sharply from the narrow waterway that they seemed to shut in the boat from the world beyond the moonlight showed a little mud fort or a thatched cottage on the bank fantastically as through a mist and from time to time as they sped forward they saw the camp-fire of a sentry and his shadows as he passed between it and them or stopped to cover it with a wood the night was so still that they could hear the waves in the steamer's wake washing up over the stones on either shore and the muffled beat of the engines echoed back from either side of the valley through which they passed there was a great lantern hanging midway from the mast and shining down upon the lower deck it showed a group of greeks turks and armenians in strange costumes sleeping huddled together in picturesque confusion over the bare boards or wide awake and voluble smoking and chatting together in happy company the music of the tisans rose in notes of passionate ecstasy and sharp unexpected bursts of melody it ceased and began again as though the musicians were feeling their way and then burst out once more into shrill defiance it stirred carlton with a strange turbulent unrest from the banks the night wind brought soft odours of fresh earth and of heavy foliage the music of different countries carlton said at last means many different things 
but it seems to me that the music of hungary is the music of love miss morris crossed her arms comfortably on the rail and he heard her laugh softly oh no it is not she said undisturbed it is a passionate gusty heady sort of love if you like but it's no more like the real thing than burgundy is like clear cold good water it's not the real thing at all i beg your pardon said carlton meekly of course i don't know anything about it he had been waked out of the spell which the knight and the tisans had placed upon him as completely as though some one had shaken him sharply by the shoulder i bow he said to your superior knowledge i know nothing about it no you are quite right i don't believe you do know anything about it said the girl or you wouldn't have made such a comparison do you know miss morris said carlton seriously that i believe i'm not able to care for a woman as other men do at least as some men do it's just lacking in me and always will be lacking it's like an ear for music if you haven't got it if it isn't born in you you'll never have it it's not a thing you can cultivate and i feel that it's not only a misfortune but a fault now i honestly believe that i care more for the princess aline whom i have never met than many other men could care for her if they knew her well but what they would feel would last and i have doubts from past experience that what i feel would i don't doubt it while it exists but it never does exist long and so i am afraid it is going to be with me to the end of the chapter he paused for a moment but the girl did not answer i am speaking in earnest now he added with a rueful laugh i see you are she replied bravely she seemed to be considering his condition as he had described it to her and he did not interrupt her from below them came the notes of the waltz the gypsies played it was full of the undercurrent of sadness that a waltz should have and filled out what carlton said as the music from the orchestra in a theatre heightens the effect without interrupting the words of the actor on the stage it is strange said miss morris i should have thought you were a man who would care very much and in just the right way but i don't believe really i'm sorry but i don't believe you do know what love means at all oh it isn't as bad as that said carlton i think i know what it is and what it means to other people but i can't feel it myself the best idea i ever got of it the thing that made it clear to me was a line in a play it seemed to express it better than any of the love poems i ever read it was in shenandoah miss morris laughed i beg your pardon said carlton i beg yours she said it was only the incongruity that struck me it seemed so odd to be quoting shenandoah here in the dardanelles with these queer people below us and ancient troy on one hand it took me by surprise that's all please go on what was it impressed you well the hero in the play said carlton is an officer in the northern army and he is lying wounded in a house near the shenandoah valley the girl he loves lives in this house and is nursing him but she doesn't love him because she sympathizes with the south at least she says she doesn't love him both armies are forming in the valley below to begin the battle and he sees his own regiment hurrying past to join them so he gets up and staggers out on the stage which is set to show the yard in front of the farmhouse 
and he calls for his horse to follow his men then the girl runs out and begs him not to go and he asks why what does it matter to her whether he goes or not and she says but i cannot let you go you may be killed and he says again what is that to you and she says it is everything to me i love you and he makes a grab at her with his wounded arm and at that instant both armies open fire in the valley below and the whole earth and sky seem to open and shut and the house rocks the girl rushes at him and crowds up against his breast and cries what is that oh what is that and he holds her tight to him and laughs and says that that's only a battle you love me miss morris looked steadfastly over the side of the boat at the waters rushing by beneath smiling to herself then she turned her face towards carlton and nodded her head at him i think she said dryly that you have a fair idea of what it means a rough working plan at least enough to begin with i said that i knew what it meant to others i am complaining that i cannot feel it myself that will come in time no doubt she said encouragingly with the air of a connoisseur and let me tell you she added that it will be all the better for the woman that you have doubted yourself so long you think so said carlton eagerly miss morris laughed at his earnestness and left him to go below to ask her aunt to join them but mrs downes preferred to read in the saloon and miss morris returned alone she had taken off her eton jacket and pulled on a heavy blue football sweater and over this a reefer the jersey clung to her and showed the lines of her figure and emphasized the freedom and grace with which she made every movement she looked as she walked at his side with her hands in the pockets of her coat and with a flat sailor hat on her head like a tall handsome boy but when they stopped and stood where the lights fell full on her hair and the exquisite colouring of her skin carlton thought her face had never seemed so delicate or fair as it did then rising from the collar of the rough jersey and contrasted with the hat and coat of a man's attire they paced the deck for an hour later until every one else had left it and at midnight were still loath to give up the beautiful night and the charm of their strange surroundings there were long silent places in their talk during which carlton tramped beside her with his head half turned looking at her and noting with an artist's eye the free light step the erect carriage and the unconscious beauty of her face the captain of the steamer joined them after midnight and falling into step pointed out to miss morris where great cities had stood where others lay buried and where beyond the hills were the almost inaccessible monasteries of the greek church the moonlight turned the banks into shadowy substances in which the ghosts of former days seemed to make a part and spurred by the young girl's interest the italian to entertain her called up all the legends of mythology and the stories of roman explorers and turkish conquerors i turn in now he said after miss morris had left them a most charming young lady is it not so he added waving his cigarette in a gesture which expressed the ineffectiveness of the adjective ah, yes very said carlton good-night sir 
he turned and leaned with both elbows on the rail and looked out at the misty banks puffing at his cigar then he dropped it hissing into the water and stifling a yawn looked up and down the length of the deserted deck it seemed particularly bare and empty what a pity she's engaged carlton said she loses so much by it they steamed slowly into the harbour of the piraeus at an early hour the next morning with a flotilla of small boats filled with shrieking porters and hotel runners at the side these men tossed their painters to the crew and crawled up them like a boarding crew of pirates running wildly about the deck and laying violent hands on any piece of baggage they saw unclaimed the passengers trunks had been thrown out in a heap on the deck and nolan and carlton were clambering over them looking for their own effects while miss morris stood below as far out of the confusion as she could place herself and pointed out the different pieces that belonged to her as she stood there one of the hotel runners a burly greasy levantine in pursuit of a possible victim shouldered her intentionally and roughly out of the way he shoved her so sharply that she lost her balance and fell back against the rail carlton saw what had happened and made a flying leap from the top of the pile of trunks landing beside her and in time to seize the escaping offender by the collar he jerked him back off his feet how dare you he began but he did not finish he felt the tips of miss morris's fingers laid upon his shoulder and her voice saying in an annoyed tone don't please don't and to his surprise his fingers lost their grip on the man's shirt his arms dropped at his side and his blood began to flow calmly again through his veins carlton was aware that he had a very quick temper he was always engaging in straight rows as he called them with men who he thought had imposed on him or some one else and though he was always ashamed of himself later his temper had never been satisfied without a blow or an apology women had also touched him before and possibly with a greater familiarity but these had stirred him not quieted him and men who had laid detaining hands on him had had them beaten down for their pains but this girl had merely touched him gently and he had been made helpless it was most perplexing and while the custom-house officials were passing his luggage he found himself rubbing his arm curiously as though it were numb and looking down at it with an amused smile he did not comment on the incident although he smiled at the recollection of his prompt obedience several times during the day but as he was stepping into the cab to drive to athens he saw the offending ruffian pass dripping with water and muttering bitter curses when he saw carlton he disappeared instantly in the crowd carlton stepped over to where nolan sat beside the driver on the box nolan he said in a low voice isn't that the fellow who yes sir said nolan touching his hat gravely he was pulling a valise one way and the gentleman that owned it sir was pulling it the other and the gentleman let go sudden and the italian went over backwards off the pier carlton smiled grimly with secret satisfaction nolan he said you're not telling the truth you did it yourself nolan touched his cap and coughed consciously 
there had been no detaining fingers on nolan's arm End of chapter 2, part 5《3》1 of the princess aline by richard harding davis this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter three part one you are coming now miss morris exclaimed carlton from the front of the carriage in which they were moving along the sunny road to athens into a land where one restores his lost illusions anybody who wishes to get back his belief in beautiful things should come here to do it just as he would go to a german sanitarium to build up his nerves or his appetite you have only to drink in the atmosphere and you are cured i know no better antidote than athens for a siege of cable cars and muddy asphalt pavements and a course of robert elsmeres and the heavenly twins wait until you see the statues of the young athletes in the museum he cried enthusiastically and get a glimpse of the blue sky back of mount humetus and the moonlight some evening on the acropolis and you'll be convinced that nothing counts for much in this world but health and straight limbs and tall marble pillars and eyes trained to see only what is beautiful give people a love for beauty and a respect for health miss morris and the result is going to be what they once had here the best art and the greatest writers and satirists and poets the same audience that applauded euripides and sophocles in the open theatre used to cross the roads the same day to applaud the athletes who ran naked in the olympian games and gave them as great honour i came here once on a walking tour with a chap who wasn't making as much of himself as he should have done and he went away a changed man and became a personage in the world and you would never guess what it was that did it he saw a statue of one of the greek gods in the museum which showed certain muscles that he couldn't find in his own body and he told me he was going to train down until they did show and he stopped drinking and loafing to do it and took to exercising and working and by the time the muscles showed out clear and strong he was so keen over life that he wanted to make the most of it and as i said he has done it that's what a respect for his own body did for him the carriage stopped at the hotel on one side of the public square of athens with the palace and its gardens blocking one end and yellow houses with red roofs and gay awnings over the caves surrounding it it was a bright sunny day and the city was clean and cool and pretty breakfast exclaimed miss morris in answer to carlton's inquiry yes i suppose so but i won't feel safe until i have my feet on that rock she was standing on the steps of the hotel looking up with expectant eager eyes at the great acropolis above the city it has been there for a long time now suggested carlton and i think you can risk its being there for a half hour longer well she said reluctantly but i don't wish to lose this chance there might be an earthquake for instance End of chapter three part one chapter three part two of the princess aline by richard harding davis this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by carolyn chapter three part two we are likely to see them this morning said carlton as he left the hotel with the ladies and drove towards the acropolis 
nolan has been interviewing the english maid and she tells him they spent the greater part of their time up there on the rock they are living very simply here as they did in paris that is for the present on wednesday the king gives a dinner and a reception in their honour when does your dinner come off asked miss morris never said carlton grimly one of the reasons why i like to come back to athens so much said mrs downs is because there are so few other tourists here to spoil the local colour for you and there are almost as few guides as tourists so that you can wander around undisturbed and discover things for yourself they don't label every fallen column and place fences around the temples they seem to put you on your good behaviour then i always like to go to a place where you are as much of a curiosity to the people as they are to you it seems to excuse your staring about you a curiosity exclaimed carlton i should say so the last time i was here i tried to wear a pair of knickerbockers around the city and the people stared so that i had to go back to the hotel and change them i shouldn't have minded it so much in any other country but i thought men who wore jaeger underclothing and women's petticoats for a national costume might have excused so slight an eccentricity as knickerbockers they had no right to throw the first stone the rock upon which the temples of the acropolis are built is more of a hill than a rock it is much steeper upon one side than the other with a sheer fall a hundred yards broad on the opposite side there are the rooms of the hospital of esculapius and the theatres of dionysus and herodes atticus the top of the rock holds the pantheon and the other smaller temples or what yet remains of them and its surface is littered with broken marble and stones and pieces of rock the top is so closely built over that the few tourists who visit it can imagine themselves its sole occupants for half an hour at a time when carlton and his friends arrived the place appeared quite deserted they left the carriage at the base of the rock and climbed up to the entrance on foot now before i go on to the pantheon said miss morris i want to walk around the sides and see what is there i shall begin with that theatre to the left and i warn you that i mean to take my time about it so you people who have been here before can run along by yourselves but i mean to enjoy it leisurely i am safe by myself here am i not she asked as safe as though you were in the metropolitan museum said carlton as he and mrs downs followed miss morris along the side of the hill towards the ruined theatre of herodes and stood at its top looking down into the basin below from their feet ran a great semicircle of marble seats descending tier below tier to a marble pavement and facing a great ruined wall of pillars and arches which in the past had formed the background to the actors from the height on which they stood above the city they could see the green country stretching out for miles on every side and swimming in the warm sunlight the dark groves of myrtle on the hills the silver ribbon of the inland water and the dark blue again sea the bleating of sheep and the tinkling of the bells came up to them from the pastures below and they imagined they could hear the shepherds piping to their flocks from one little hilltop to another the country is not much changed said carlton 
and when you stand where we are now you can imagine that you see the procession winding its way over the road to the eleusinian mysteries with the gilded chariots and the children carrying garlands and the priestesses leading the bulls for the sacrifice what can we imagine is going on here said miss morris pointing with her parasol to the theatre below oh this is much later said carlton this was built by the romans they used to act and to hold their public meetings here this corresponds to the top row of our gallery and you can imagine that you are looking down on the bent backs of hundreds of bald-headed men in white robes listening to the speakers strutting about below there i wonder how much they could hear from this height said mrs downs well they had that big wall for a sounding-board and the air is so soft here that their voices should have carried easily and i believe they were masks with mouthpieces that conveyed the sound like a fireman's trumpet if you like i will run down there and call up to you and you can hear how it sounded i will speak in my natural voice first and if that doesn't reach you wave your parasol and i will try a little louder oh do said miss morris it will be very good of you i should like to hear a real speech in the theatre of herodes she said as she seated herself on the edge of the marble crater i'll have to speak in english said carlton as he disappeared my greek isn't good enough to carry that far mrs downs seated herself beside her niece and carlton began scrambling down the side of the amphitheatre the marble benches were broken in parts and where they were perfect were covered with a fine layer of moss as smooth and as soft as green velvet so that carlton when he was not laboriously feeling for his next foothold with the toe of his boot was engaged in picking spring flowers from the beds of moss and sticking them for safekeeping in his buttonhole he was several minutes in making the descent and so busily occupied in doing it that he did not look up until he had reached the level of the ground and jumped lightly from the first row of seats to the stage covered with moss which lay like a heavy rug over the marble pavement when he did look up he saw a tableau that made his heart which was beating quickly from the exertion of the descent stand still with consternation the hohenwalds had in his short absence descended from the entrance of the acropolis and had to stop on their way to the road below to look into the cool green and white basin of the theatre at the moment carlton looked up the duke was standing in front of mrs downs and miss morris and all of the men had their hats off then in pantomime and silhouetted against the blue sky behind them carlton saw the princesses advance beside their brother and mrs downs and her niece curtsied three times and then the whole party faced about in a line and looked down at him the meaning of the tableau was only too plain good heavens gasped carlton everybody's getting introduced to everybody else and i've missed the whole thing if they think i'm going to stay down here and amuse them and miss all the fun myself they are greatly mistaken he made a mad rush for the front first row of seats but there was a cry of remonstrance from above and looking up he saw all the men waving him back speech cried the young english captain applauding loudly as though welcoming an actor on his first entrance hats off he cried down in front speech 
confound that ass said carlton dropping back to the marble pavement again and gazing impotently up at the row of figures outlined against the sky i must look like a bear in the bear pit at the zoo he growled they'll be throwing buns to me next he could see the two elder sisters talking to mrs downs who was evidently explaining his purpose in going down to the stage of the theatre and he could see the princess aline bending forward with both hands on her parasol and smiling the captain made a trumpet of his hands and asked why he didn't begin hello how are you carlton called back waving his hat at him in some embarrassment i wonder if i look as much like a fool as i feel he muttered what did you say we can't hear you answered the captain louder louder called the equerries carlton swore at them under his breath and turned and gazed around the hole in which he was penned in order to make them believe that he had given up the idea of making a speech or had ever intended doing so he tried to think of something clever to shout back at them and rejected ye men of athens as being too flippant and friends countrymen romans as requiring too much effort when he looked up again the hornwalds were moving on their way and as he started once more to scale the sides of the theatre the duke waved his hand at him in farewell and gave another hand to his sisters who disappeared with him behind the edge of the upper row of seats carlton turned at once and dropped into one of the marble chairs and bowed his head when he did reach the top miss morris held out a sympathetic hand to him and shook her head sadly but he could see that she was pressing her lips tightly together to keep from smiling oh it's all very funny for you he said refusing her hand i don't believe you are in love with anybody you don't know what it means they revisited the rock on the next day and on the day after and then left athens for an inland excursion to stay overnight miss morris returned from it with the sense of having done her duty once and by so doing having earned the right to act as she pleased in the future what she best pleased to do was to wander about over the broad top of the acropolis with no serious intent of studying its historical values but rather as she explained it for the simple satisfaction of feeling that she was there she liked to stand on the edge of the low wall along its top and look out over the picture of sea and plain and mountains that lay below her the sun shone brightly and the wind swept by them as though they were on the bridge of an ocean steamer and there was the added invigorating sense of pleasure that comes to us when we stand on a great height carlton was sitting at her feet shielded from the wind by a fallen column and gazing up at her with critical approval you look like a sort of a winged victory up there he said with the wind blowing your skirts about and your hair coming down i don't remember that the winged victory has any hair to blow about suggested miss morris i'd like to paint you continued carlton just as you are standing now only i would put in a greek dress and you could stand a greek dress better than almost any one i know i would paint you with your head up and one hand shielding your eyes and the other pressed against your breast it would be stunning he spoke enthusiastically but in quite an impersonal tone as though he were discussing the posing of a model miss morris jumped down from the low wall on which she had been standing and said simply of course i should like to have you paint me very much 
mrs downs looked up with interest to see if mr carlton was serious when said carlton vaguely oh i don't know of course this is entirely too nice to last and you will be going home soon and then when i do get back to the states you will you will have other things to do yes repeated miss morris i shall have something else to do besides gazing out at the aegean sea she raised her head and looked across the rock for a moment with some interest her eyes which had grown wistful lighted again with amusement here are your friends she said smiling no exclaimed carlton scrambling at his feet yes said miss morris the duke has seen us and is coming over here when carlton had gained his feet and turned to look his friends had separated in different directions and were strolling about alone or in pairs among the great columns of the pantheon but the duke came directly towards them and seated himself on a low block of marble in front of the two ladies after a word or two about the beauties of the place he asked if they would go to the reception which the king gave to him on the day following they answered that they should like to come very much and the prince expressed his satisfaction and said that he would see that the chamberlain sent them invitations and you mr carlton you will come also i hope i wish you to be presented to my sisters they are only amateurs in art but they are great admirers of your work and they have rebuked me for not having already presented you we were all disappointed he continued courteously at not having you to dine with us that night in constantinople but now i trust i shall see something of you here you must tell us what we are to admire that is very easy said carlton everything you are quite right said the prince bowing to the ladies as he moved away it is all very beautiful well now you certainly will meet her said miss morris oh no i won't said carlton with resignation i have had two chances and lost them and i'll miss this one too well there is a chance you shouldn't miss said miss morris pointing and nodding her head there she is now and all alone she's sketching isn't she or taking notes what is she doing carlton looked eagerly in the direction miss morris had signified and saw the princess aline sitting at some distance from them with a book on her lap she glanced up from this now and again to look at something ahead of her and was apparently deeply absorbed in her occupation there is your opportunity said mrs downs and we are going back to the hotel shall we see you at luncheon yes said carlton unless i get a position as drawing-master in that case i shall be here teaching the three amateurs in art do you think i can do it he asked miss morris decidedly she answered i have found you a most educational young person they went away together and carlton moved cautiously towards the spot where the princess was sitting he made a long and roundabout detour as he did so in order to keep himself behind her he did not mean to come so near that she would see him but he took a certain satisfaction in looking at her when she was alone though her loneliness was only a matter of the moment and though he knew that her people were within a hundred yards of her he was in consequence somewhat annoyed and surprised to see another young man dodging in and out among the pillars of the pantheon immediately ahead of him and to find that this young man also had his attention centred on the young girl who sat unconsciously sketching in the foreground 
now what the devil can he want muttered carlton his imagination taking alarm at once if it would only prove to be some one who meant harm to her he thought a brigand or a beggar who might be obligingly insolent or even a tipsy man what a chance it would afford for heroic action with this hope he moved forward quickly but silently hoping that the stranger might prove even to be an anarchist with a grudge against royalty and as he advanced he had the satisfaction of seeing the princess glance over her shoulder and observing the man rise and walk quickly away towards the edge of the rock there she seated herself with her face towards the city and with her back firmly set against her pursuer he is annoying her exclaimed carlton delightedly as he hurried forward it looks as though my chance had come at last but as he approached the stranger he saw to his great disappointment that he had nothing more serious to deal with than one of the international army of amateur photographers who had been stalking the princess as a hunter follows an elk or as he would have stalked a racehorse or a prominent politician or a lord mayor's show everything being fish that came within the focus of his camera a helpless statue and an equally helpless young girl were both good subjects and at his mercy he was bending over with an anxious expression of countenance and focusing his camera on the back of the princess aline when carlton approached from the rear as the young man put his finger on the button of the camera carlton jogged his arm with his elbow and pushed the enthusiastic tourist to one side say exclaimed that individual look where you're going will you you spoiled that plate i'll spoil your camera if you annoy that young lady any longer said carlton in a low voice the photographer was rapidly rewinding his roll and the fire of pursuit was still in his eye she's a princess he explained with an excited whisper well said carlton even a princess is entitled to some consideration besides he said in a more amicable tone you haven't a permit to photograph on the acropolis you know you haven't carlton was quite sure of this because there were no such permits the amateur looked up in some dismay i didn't know you had to have them he said where can i get one the king may give you one said carlton he lives at the palace if they catch you up here without a license they will confiscate your camera and lock you up you had better vanish before they see you thank you i will said the tourist anxiously now thought carlton smiling pleasantly when he goes to the palace with that box and asks for a permit they'll think he is either a dynamiter or a crank and before they are through with him his interest in photography will have sustained a severe shock as carlton turned from watching the rapid flight of the photographer he observed that the princess had remarked it also and she had no doubt been a witness of what had passed even if she had not overheard all that had been said she rose from her enforced position of refuge with a look of relief and came directly towards carlton along the rough path that led through the debris on the top of the acropolis carlton had thought as he watched her sitting on the wall with her chin resting on her hand that she would make a beautiful companion picture to the one he had wished to paint of miss morris 
the one girl standing upright looking fearlessly out to sea on the top of the low wall with the wind blowing her skirts about her and her hair tumbled in the breeze and the other seated bending intently forward as though watching for the return of a long-delayed vessel a beautifully sad face fine and delicate and noble the face of a girl on the figure of a woman and when she rose he made no effort to move away or indeed to pretend not to have seen her but stood looking at her though he had the right to do so and as though she must know he had that right as she came towards him the princess aline did not stop nor even shorten her steps but as she passed opposite to him she bowed her thanks with a sweet impersonal smile and a dropping of the eyes and continued steadily on her way carlton stood for some short time looking after her with his hat still at his side she seemed farther from him at that moment than she ever had been before although she had for the first time recognized him but he knew that it was only as a human being that she had recognized him he put on his hat and sat down on a rock with his elbows on his knees and filled his pipe if that had been any other girl he thought i would have gone up to her and said was that man annoying you and she would have said yes thank you or something and i would have walked along with her until we had come up to her friends and she would have told them i had been of some slight service to her and they would have introduced us and all would have gone well but because she is a princess she cannot be approached in that way at least she does not think so and i have to act as she has been told i should act and not as i think i should after all she is only a very beautiful girl and she must be very tired of her cousins and her grandmothers and of not being allowed to see any one else these royalties make a very picturesque show for the rest of us but indeed it seems rather hard on them a hundred years from now there will be no more kings and queens and the writers of that day will envy us just as the writers of this day envy the men who wrote of chivalry and tournaments and they will have to choose their heroes from bank presidents and their heroines from lady lawyers and girl politicians and typewriters what a stupid world it will be then End of chapter three part two Chapter Three, Part Three of *The Princess Aline* by Richard Harding Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Three, Part Three. The next day brought the reception to the Hohenwalds, and Carlton, entering the reading room of the hotel on the same afternoon found miss morris and her aunt there together taking tea they both looked at him with expressions of such genuine commiseration that he stopped just as he was going to seat himself and eyed them defiantly don't tell me he exclaimed that this has fallen through too miss morris nodded her head silently carlton dropped into the chair beside them and folded his arms with a frown of grim resignation what is it he asked have they postponed the reception no miss morris said but the princess aline will not be there of course not said carlton calmly of course not may i ask why i knew that she wouldn't be there but i may possibly be allowed to express some curiosity 
she turned her ankle on one of the loose stones on the acropolis this afternoon said miss morris and sprained it so badly that they had to carry her who carried her carlton demanded fiercely some of her servants of course of course cried carlton that's the way it always will be i was there the whole afternoon and i didn't see her i wasn't there to help her it's fate that's what it is fate there's no use in my trying to fight against fate still he added anxiously with a sudden access of hope she may be well by this evening i hardly think she will said miss morris but we will trust so the king's palace and gardens stretch along one end of the public park and are but just across the street from the hotel where the hohenwalds and the americans were staying as the hotel was the first building on the left of the square carlton could see from his windows the illuminations and the guards of honour and the carriages arriving and departing and the citizens of athens crowding the parks and peering through the iron rails into the king's garden it was a warm night and lighted grandly by a full moon that showed the acropolis in silhouette against the sky and gave a strangely theatrical look to the yellow house fronts and red roofs of the town every window in the broad front of the palace was illuminated and through the open doors came the sound of music and one without could see rows of tall servants in the king's blue and white livery and the men of his guard in their white petticoats and black and white jackets and red caps carlton pulled a light coat over his evening dress and with an agitation he could hardly explain walked across the street and entered the palace the line of royalties had broken by the time he reached the ballroom and the not over severe etiquette of the greek court left him free after a bow to those who still waited to receive it to move about as he pleased his most earnest desire was to learn whether or not the princess aline was present and with that end he clutched the english adjutant as that gentleman was hurrying past him and asked eagerly if the princess had recovered from her accident no said the officer she is able to walk about but not to stand and sit out a dinner and dance and all this sort of thing too bad wasn't it yes said carlton very bad he released his hand from the other's arm and dropped back among the men grouped about the doorway his disappointment was very keen indeed he had not known how much this meeting with the princess had meant to him until he experienced this disappointment which was succeeded by a wish to find miss morris and have her sympathize and laugh with him he became conscious as he searched with growing impatience the faces of those passing and repassing before him of how much the habit of going to miss morris for sympathy in this unlucky love affair had grown of late upon him he wondered what he would have done in his travels without her and whether he should have had the interest to carry on his pursuit had she not been there to urge him on and to mock at him when he grew faint-hearted but when he finally did discover her he stood quite still and for an instant doubted if it were she the girl he saw seemed to be a more beautiful sister of the miss morris he knew a taller fairer and more radiant personage 
and he feared that it was not she until he remembered that this was the first time he had ever seen her with her hair dressed high upon her head and in the more distinguished accessories of a decollete gown and train miss morris had her hand on the arm of one of the equerries who was battling good-naturedly with the crowd and trying to draw her away from the two persistent youths in diplomatic uniform who were laughing and pressing forward in close pursuit on the other side carlton approached her with a certain feeling of diffidence which was most unusual to him and asked if she were dancing mr carlton shall decide for me miss morris said dropping the equerry's arm and standing beside the american i have promised all of these gentlemen she explained to dance with them and now they won't agree as to which is to dance first they've wasted half of this waltz already in discussing it and they make it much more difficult by saying that no matter how i decide they will fight duels with the one i choose which is most unpleasant for me most unpleasant for the gentleman you choose too suggested carlton so continued miss morris i have decided to leave it to you well if i am to arbitrate between the powers said carlton with a glance at the three uniforms my decision is that as they insist on fighting duels in any event you had better dance with me until they have settled it between them and then the survivor can have the next dance that's a very good idea said miss morris and taking carlton's arm she bowed to the three men and drew away mr carlton said the equerry with a bow has added another argument in favour of maintaining standing armies and of not submitting questions to arbitration let's get out of this said carlton you don't want to dance do you let us go where it is cool he led her down the stairs and out on to the terrace they did not speak again until they had left it and were walking under the trees in the queen's garden he had noticed as they made their way through the crowd how the men and women turned to look at her and made way for her and how utterly unconscious she was of their doing so with that unconsciousness which comes from familiarity with such discrimination and carlton himself held his head a little higher with the pride and pleasure the thought gave him that he was in such friendly sympathy with so beautiful a creature he stopped before a low stone bench that stood on the edge of the path surrounded by a screen of tropical trees and guarded by a marble statue they were in deep shadow themselves but the moonlight fell on the path at their feet and through the trees on the other side of the path they could see the open terrace of the palace with the dancers moving in and out of the lighted windows the splash of a fountain came from some short distance behind them and from time to time they heard the strains of a regimental band alternating with the softer strains of a waltz played by a group of hungarian musicians for a moment neither of them spoke but sat watching the white dresses of the women and the uniforms of the men moving in and out among the trees lighted by the lanterns hanging from the branches and the white mist of the moon do you know said carlton i'm rather afraid of you to-night he paused and watched her for a little time as she sat upright with her hands folded on her lap you are so very resplendent and queenly and altogether different he added the girl moved her bare shoulders slightly and leaned back against the bench 
the princess did not come she said no carlton answered with a sudden twinge of conscience at having forgotten that fact that's one of the reasons i took you away from those men he explained i wanted you to sympathize with me miss morris did not answer him at once she did not seem to be in a sympathetic mood her manner suggested rather that she was tired and troubled i need sympathy myself to-night she said we received a letter after dinner that brought bad news for us we must go home at once bad news exclaimed carlton with much concern from home yes from home she replied but there's nothing wrong there it's only bad news for us my sister has decided to be married in june instead of july and that cuts us out of a month on the continent that's all we shall have to leave immediately to-morrow it seems that mr abbey is able to go away sooner than he had hoped and they are to be married on the first mr abbey exclaimed carlton catching at the name but your sister isn't going to marry him is she miss morris turned her head in some surprise yes why not she said but i say cried carlton i thought your aunt told me you were going to marry abby she told me so that day on the steamer when he came to see you off i marry him my aunt told you impossible said miss morris smiling she probably said that her niece was going to marry him she meant my sister they had been engaged some time then uh, who are you going to marry stammered carlton i'm not going to marry any one said miss morris carlton stared at her blankly in amazement oh well that's most absurd he exclaimed he recognized instantly that the expression was hardly adequate but he could not readjust his mind so suddenly to the new idea and he remained looking at her with many confused memories rushing through his brain a dozen questions were on his tongue he remembered afterwards how he had noticed a servant trimming the candle in one of the orange-coloured lanterns and that he had watched him as he disappeared among the palms the silence lasted for so long a time that it had taken on a significance in itself which carlton recognised he pulled himself up with a short laugh well he remonstrated mirthlessly i don't think you've treated me very well how not treated you very well miss morris asked settling herself more easily she had been sitting during the pause which followed carlton's discovery with a certain rigidity as if she was on a strain of attention but her tone was now as friendly as always and held its customary suggestion of amusement carlton took his tone from it although his mind was still busily occupied with incidents and words of hers that she had spoken in their past intercourse not fair in letting me think you were engaged he said i've wasted so much time i'm not half civil enough to engaged girls he explained you've been quite civil enough to us said miss morris as a courier philosopher and friend i'm very sorry we have to part company part company exclaimed carlton in sudden alarm but i say we mustn't do that but we must you see said miss morris we must go back for the wedding and you will have to follow the princess aline yes of course carlton heard his own voice say i had forgotten the princess aline 
but he was not thinking of what he was saying nor of the princess aline he was thinking of the many hours miss morris and he had been together of the way she had looked at certain times and of how he had caught himself watching her at others how he had pictured the absent mr abbey travelling with her later over the same route and without a chaperon sitting close at her side or holding her hand and telling her just how pretty she was whenever he wished to do so and without any fear of the consequences he remembered how ready she had been to understand what he was going to say before he had finished saying it and how she had always made him show the best of himself and had caused him to leave unsaid many things that became common and unworthy when considered in the light of her judgment he recalled how impatient he had been when she was late at dinner and how cross he was throughout one whole day when she had kept her room he felt with a sudden shock of delightful fear that he had grown to depend upon her that she was the best companion he had ever known and he remembered moments when they had been alone together at the table or in some old palace or during a long walk when they had seemed to have the whole world entirely to themselves and how he had consoled himself at such times with the thought that no matter how long she might be abby's wife there had been these moments in her life which were his with which abby had nothing to do carlton turned and looked at her with strange wide-open eyes as though he saw her for the first time he felt so sure of himself and of his love for her that the happiness of it made him tremble and he thought that if he spoke she might answer him in the old friendly mocking tone of good fellowship filled him with alarm at that moment it seemed to carlton that the most natural thing in the world for them to do would be to go back again together over the road they had come seeing everything in the new light of his love for her and so travel on and on for ever over the world learning to love each other more and more each succeeding day and leaving the rest of the universe to move along without them he leaned forward with his arm along the back of the bench and bent his face towards hers her hand lay at her side and his own closed over it but the shock that the touch of her fingers gave him stopped and confused the words upon his tongue he looked strangely at her and could not find the speech he needed miss morris gave his hand a firm friendly little pressure and drew her own away as if he had taken hers only in an exuberance of good feeling you have been very nice to us she said with an effort to make her tone sound kindly and approving and we you mustn't go i can't let you go said carlton hoarsely there was no mistaking his tone or his earnestness now if you go he went on breathlessly i must go with you the girl moved restlessly she leaned forward and drew in her breath with a slight nervous tremor then she turned and faced him almost as though she were afraid of him or of herself and they sat so for an instant in silence the air seemed to have grown close and heavy and carlton saw her dimly in the silence he heard the splash of the fountain behind them and the rustling of the leaves in the night wind and the low sighing murmur of a waltz he raised his head to listen and she saw in the moonlight that he was smiling 
it was as though he wished to delay any answer she might make to his last words that is the waltz he said still speaking in a whisper that the gipsies played that night he stopped and miss morris answered him by bending her head slowly in assent it seemed to be an effort for her to even make that slight gesture you don't remember it said carlton it meant nothing to you i mean that night on the steamer when i told you what love meant to other people what a fool i was he said with an uncertain laugh yes i remember it she said last thursday night on the steamer thursday night exclaimed carlton indignantly wednesday night tuesday night how should i know what night of the week it was it was the night of my life to me that night i knew that i loved you as i had never hoped to care for any one in this world when i told you that i did not know what love meant i felt all the time that i was lying i knew that i loved you and that i could never love any one else and that i had never loved any one before and if i had thought then you could care for me your engagement or your promises would never have stopped my telling you so you said that night that i would learn to love all the better and more truly for having doubted myself so long and oh edith he cried taking both her hands and holding them close in his own i cannot let you go now i love you so don't laugh at me don't mock at me all the rest of my life depends on you and then miss morris laughed softly just as he had begged her not to do but her laughter was so full of happiness and came so gently and sweetly and spoke so truly of content that though he let go of her hands with one of his it was only that he might draw her to him until her face touched his and she felt the strength of his arm as he held her against his breast the hohenwalds occupied the suite of rooms on the first floor of the hotel with the privilege of using the broad balcony that reached out from it over the front entrance and at the time when mrs downs and edith morris and carlton drove up to the hotel from the ball the princess aline was leaning over the balcony and watching the lights go out in the upper part of the house and the moonlight as it fell on the trees and the statues in the public park below her foot was still in bandages and she was wrapped in a long cloak to keep her from the cold inside of the open windows that led out on to the balcony her sisters were taking off their ornaments and discussing the incidents of the night just over the princess aline unnoticed by those below saw carlton help mrs downs to alight from the carriage and gave his hand to another muffled figure that followed her and while mrs downs was ascending the steps and before the second muffled figure had left the shadow of the carriage and stepped into the moonlight the princess aline saw carlton draw her suddenly back and kiss her lightly on the cheek and heard a protesting gasp and saw miss morris pull her cloak over her head and run up the steps then she saw carlton shake hands with them and stand for a moment after they had disappeared gazing up at the moon and fumbling in the pockets of his coat he drew out a cigar-case and leisurely selected a cigar and with much apparent content lighted it and then with his head thrown back and his chest expanded as though he were challenging the world 
he strolled across the street and disappeared among the shadows of the deserted park the princess walked to one of the open windows and stood there leaning against the side that young mr carlton the artist she said to her sisters is engaged to that beautiful american girl we met the other day really said the elder sister i thought it was probable who told you i saw him kiss her good night said the princess stepping into the window as they got out of their carriage just now the princess aline stood for a moment looking thoughtfully at the floor and then walked across the room to a little writing-desk she unlocked a drawer in this and took from it two slips of paper which she folded in her hand then she returned slowly across the room and stepped out again onto the balcony one of the pieces of paper held the picture carlton had drawn of her and under which he had written this is she do you wonder i travelled four thousand miles to see her and the other was the picture of carlton himself which she had cut out of the catalogue of the salon from the edge of the balcony where the princess stood she could see the glimmer of carlton's white linen and the red glow of his cigar as he strode proudly up and down the path of the public park like a sentry keeping watch she folded the pieces of paper together and tore them slowly into tiny fragments and let them fall through her fingers into the street below then she returned again to the room and stood looking at her sisters do you know she said i think i am a little tired of travelling so much i want to go back to grasse she put her hand to her forehead and held it there for a moment i think i am a little homesick said the princess aline the end end of the princess aline by richard harding davis recorded by caroline in september two thousand and twelve in groningen in the netherlands thank you for listening